to be here at uh, the Department of the Interior in this historic hall, in uh, part because we just heard from the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and we will hear from him again later today. And in large part, because of the fact that he has assembled a stellar team on his cabinet, who you will be interacting with and hearing from as the day goes on. I'm not sure that in the history of this country, in fact, I, in fact, I'll just say it, in the history of this country, I am confident that there has never been a gathering like this where a president of the United States has brought his chief executives running all of the departments of state of, of the national government to have this kind of conversation. And so today, at this point in time in our conference, uh, we move forward with uh, the econo Economic Development, Natural Resources, Energy, and Agriculture Panel. And uh, we will have opening comments from each of the secretaries. All of them are stars in their own right. Uh, to my left is uh, Tom Vilsack, who is uh, the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. He is a former two-term governor of the state of Iowa and someone who has been having listening sessions, including uh, rural listening sessions uh, and also sessions with uh, Indian communities across the country. Give Tom Vilsack a round of applause. Welcome to the Department of Interior. To his left, uh, another very popular governor from the state of Washington, Gary Locke. Gary Locke. <laughs> Gary Locke uh, is a man about creating jobs and opportunity for everybody across America, and uh, we are humbled and honored to have him as a member of the Obama team, so give him a round of applause, the Secretary of Commerce. And to my right, uh, the person who is uh, spearheading the uh, energy revolution for the United States and for the world, uh, Nobel uh, prize winner in physics in 1997, and a great catch for President Barack Obama to run the Department of Energy, Stephen Chu. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and the person who is safeguarding the environment of uh, this nation and in the world and making great strides uh, in uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is the administrator, uh, the first African American to ever run that agency, and I can tell you, working hand in hand with her, that uh, she is doing a stellar job for President Obama and for this nation, and that is Lisa Jackson, my colleague on the cabinet. I want you to hear from each of them, and then we'll go ahead and we'll uh, engage in an interactive uh, question and answer period with all of you. So we'll just uh, start from our left and uh, go all the way to our right, starting with you, Secretary Comer, the Secretary Locke. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary, uh, for your great work uh, and leadership here at the Department of Interior. And, and uh, uh, Secretary Salazar, as you all know, has had a very distinguished career also in the United States Senate and as a law enforcement officer, attorney general in uh, the state of Colorado. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and great to see so many friends from the state of Washington as well. Uh, I know that we have a lot of issues to discuss and we're supposed to keep our opening comments super, super, super short. But let me just say that we at the Department of Commerce are committed to helping create more jobs in America. More jobs, and I know that uh, in Indian land, issues of unemployment, social services are particularly acute. And we need to really bring all the forces to bear of the entire federal agencies, uh, all the other federal government agencies, to really focus on creating more jobs, good paying jobs for every person uh, within uh, this land, including Indian Nation. I'm really pleased that uh, when I was governor of the state of Washington, I was able to work with uh, the leaders of the 26 different federally recognized tribes, and so many of you are here today. And uh, we worked a lot on natural resource issues, uh, truly a government-to-government -government basis. I really believe and respect the sovereignty uh, of all the, the tribes, not just in the state of Washington, but now all across America. But we also uh, focused on cultural issues and uh, in addition to natural resource issues, focusing on economic diversification. Uh, so many of the tribes in the state of Washington all around America uh, depend either on natural resources, have moved into gaming, but are still trying to diversify. And we were able to incorporate the tribes to take them on our uh, foreign trade missions to really help in increase trade and to bring more jobs 
uh, to the people of Indian country. I want to let you know that I have one person in the Department of Commerce that I count on and who has absolute direct access to my office to me any time on any issue, and that's our Senior Advisor for Native American Affairs, Don Chapman. So Don, he's over there. Stand up. Just stand up. Back there. So uh, uh, he's with the uh, Mohican uh, Tribe of Connecticut, and so any issues, any issues, please contact Don, and uh, he has uh, open access uh, to us and to my office. I want to let you know that the Department of Commerce is expanding on the relationship that already that we have between the department and tribal nations. Just this year alone, uh, we've already awarded some $16 million in grants uh, to tribes uh, or Native uh, American-owned businesses. Seven million of that was under the Stimulus or the Recovery Act. Uh, but we also have uh, programs uh, to help Amer uh, Native American companies. And we've helped nearly 500 Native American-owned businesses get contracts uh, worth more than $93 million. We've helped uh, tribes secure more than $54 million in loans uh, to support business activities. But we need to do better. We need to do more. And uh, I want to let you know that we are absolutely committed as part of the economic recovery of this nation to make sure that that recovery and the prosperity of America includes uh, tribal lands and tribal people. So thank you very much. Secretary Tom Vilsack. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Secretary Salazar. Uh, I too wish to thank you for uh, giving us this uh, extraordinary opportunity to meet with uh, tribal leaders from all over uh, the United States. And I want to say that it is a distinct privilege for me to be in your company today. Uh, we certainly appreciate the time the tribal leaders are taking uh, to travel to Washington, D.C., uh, to have uh, this dialogue and consultation. Uh, and certainly appreciated that many of you were able to find time to be at USDA yesterday. Uh, for a series of discussions about our, our programs. I hope that you learned uh, a good deal about how the USDA can partner uh, with uh, peoples from all over uh, the country. Uh, in the brief time that I have, I, I want to take this opportunity to make sure that you know that we have uh, two very high-ranking officials uh, from the USDA who are here today uh, who you will want to know and want to get to know better. Uh, Mary McNeil, who is the uh, Deputy uh, Assistant uh, Secretary for Civil Rights, and Janie Hipp, who is uh, uh, running our, our Native American office, are here today. Uh, Mary and Janie, if you are in the audience, if you could stand, that would be helpful in the back there. Mary is a, a proud member of the Winnebago uh, tribe from Nebraska, and Janie uh, is certainly proud of her Chickasaw heritage, and, and I think these are two individuals that will help uh, navigate through the, the difficulties that one can experience in a federal bureaucracy. So please get to know them well. Four principal concerns that I'll talk about very briefly today. Um, there are a multitude of places where the USDA uh, intersects with uh, concerns. Uh, but certainly the Forest Service is one area where we recognize and appreciate uh, that the way in which we manage our forests, 193 million acres of land, must be sensitive uh, to the many important and sacred places uh, in, uh, that are impacted or potentially impacted by what we do with our Forest Service. Uh, we need to continue our consultation and continue our discussions uh, to make sure that we, uh, that we manage our forests in an appropriate way and also recognize the important role that they play in uh, providing subsistence opportunities for Native Americans. Uh, we, are, uh, we have work to do uh, in this area, uh, but I think we are more sensitive than we've been uh, for some time, and, and we look forward to continued dialogue. Uh, the second area is in food assistance. Um, the entire country, uh, but certainly American Indians and Native Alaskans have issues uh, with reference to hunger and obesity, which we all are dealing with in this country. Uh, we want to uh, improve the nutritional value of the food assistance that's provided, and we want to expand access uh, to the many programs that we have to provide help and assistance. We know that food is expensive, and it is particularly expensive in rural areas, and it is particularly expensive uh, uh, for the people represented in this room today. Uh, so we need to do a better job of providing access to our programs and making sure that our programs are sensitive uh, to the cultural needs uh, of Native Americans and Native Alaskans. Uh, Gary mentioned, Gary Locke mentioned the need for jobs. That certainly is true in rural areas. Uh, we are looking forward to the development of new ways to approach economic development. 
uh, in regions across the country. Uh, we are challenging uh, regions of the country to ask the question, how can we help uh, your, your place, uh, the place that's important to you, your home area, your region, become a great place to live, work, and raise families? What can we do uh, to utilize the programs the federal government has within USDA to make that happen? We know one of those ways is in, uh, is in farming. Uh, and we obviously want to assist particularly beginning farmers uh, and socially disadvantaged farmers for being able to have the opportunity uh, to farm the land and to farm it in, in the appropriate way. It's one of the reasons why we've got a tribal relations office and one of the reasons why we've set up an office of outreach and advocacy. These two offices are now uh, in the process of being staffed, uh, commitments of resources, over a million dollars in the tribal relations office in particular. Uh, and, and a million point seven, um, 1.7 million for the Office of Outreach and Advocacy are designed to help and assist uh, beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers being able to access USDA programs. So there is an awful lot of work that we need to do together. Uh, we need your help, uh, we need your, your direction, uh, we need your advice, uh, and we want to uh, be there to help. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this, uh, this afternoon, and I look forward to the question and answer uh, session. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. <laughs> Secretary Chu. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. Uh, the Department of Energy's missions touch any country in many ways. And uh, I'm very glad to be here to continue the dialogues that I've started uh, in several areas in the country. We're committed to a meaningful discussion, dialogue uh, with the tribes in, our in the country, the government to government basis. Um, also, we, I have to confess, we have a, uh, an Office of Indian Policy and Programs. So we've been slow in getting a director, uh, taking a much more proactive role in trying to appoint the director and to staff this office as quickly as possible. So let me mention two issues. One I'm acutely aware of, uh, that several tribal nations are the border on the legacy of the Manhattan Project and the Cold War. And we have an obligation in the Department of Energy and the United States to protect the health and treaty rights of the tribes, as well as the cultural and natural resources that are important to you. The Recovery Act has contained $6 billion to accelerate the cleanup efforts of that legacy. I recently met with four of the tribes at the Hanford site, the Yakima Nation, the Nez Perce tribe, the Confederated tribes of Umatilla and the Wanapum people, to get their input on, on how to carry out this work in the quickest way possible to restore the land that uh, is so important to you. And overall, I believe the Recovery Act will allow us to shrink the footprint of our cleanup sites more than 40% by 2011. The second is that the Department of Energy is very committed to promoting energy development. And in August, I saw firsthand the unique challenges facing the Alaska Native communities. For example, I visited a village where one had to import by barge diesel fuel, heating oil, fuel and oil that costs seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon, uh, and that's the only source of electricity. And so we are pushing very hard to promote new sources of energy generation, energy conservation, so that the energy, the electricity, the heat is used as wisely as possible. And I saw some very good things. I saw a very innovative project, uh, a, a new school, which is highly energy efficient, and a rural wind turbine that could uh, take care of much of the needs. Um, the department has already put $13.6 million towards 36 tribal energy projects this year. We are also making significant investments through President Obama's Recovery Act in energy efficiency in tribal areas. In fact, we've already distribute, distributed $35 million of recovery funding to tribes for weatherization and energy efficiency projects. And we expect to award another $29 million in the next few months. Uh, we are going to be increasingly working with the tribes to, to make sure that this money is spent in the wisest uh, way possible to really help save money and energy. We're also trying to bring more of the Indian country on the grid, and, and not only bring it on the grid, but even in cases where it doesn't look like it's immediately possible to bring it on the grid, like parts of Western Alaska, 
to develop energy storage mechanisms so that more and more increasingly large amounts of energy can be generated on your lands and stored uh, to be used so that you can get off of this uh, terribly, terribly expensive use of um, petroleum products. Um, to that end, we are aggressively funding battery projects, battery projects and stationary batteries that, that can economically store the energy at hundreds of kilowatt levels uh, that you could have then energy on tap. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, we're pursuing. We're very committed in order to bring new clean energy projects, also committed to have it so that you can actually, in terms of economic development, uh, you have the land, the energy resources, the sun, the wind, and, and how do we uh, help you develop those resources, uh, both for the benefit of your tribe, but also for the benefit of uh, the country in terms of getting these renewable energy resources. So again, I look forward to uh, the discussion we're about to have. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Administrator Jackson. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. First, uh, thanks to you for your leadership, uh, along with that of our presidents, obviously, for having this and hosting this historic occasion here in this beautiful space. And to my colleagues in the cabinet, it's always good to see them. They're part of the green cabinet, so uh, I see them more often than some. Uh, my respect and honor to each and every one of the leaders here today. I will be in trouble if I don't personally take a moment to pay special uh, respects to two uh, tribal communities that formed who I am as a person. The first is the St. Regis Mohawk Nation in Aquasasan in New York. I worked with uh, people there through uh, my career at EPA in, uh, out of the New York office, and I count uh, still uh, the lessons I learned and the friends I made there. So my salute to you. And second, to the Ramapo people of Ringwood, New Jersey, as a reminder to those of us who, uh, I know these are federally recognized tribes, but a reminder for all of us that uh, others who may not be here uh, certainly still constitute an important part of our, uh, our heritage here in this country and are also fighting uh, for issues that are important to us. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in the EPA seat because EPA is proud of its uh, 25th year of partnership. In 1984, EPA became the very first federal agency to adopt an official Indian policy. And not too long ago, I reaffirmed that policy. There are posters of it hanging up uh, at the doors to greet EPA employees even today to remind us of the importance of, uh, of working together with tribal communities. And it's really important now, because we have critical issues on the environmental front uh, still before us. As you all know, almost one in 10 tribal homes lack safe drinking water and wastewater handling. That's 10 times the rate of non-tribal homes in the United States today. Hazardous waste sites and open dumps still expose tribal residents to toxins and contaminants. We know that climate change is not a distant threat for a far our future uh, for our Alaskan natives and for those tribes uh, who uh, along coastal areas who are dealing with loss of habitat, with loss of rivers, with loss of streams, with eroding shorelines, with loss of heritage. Near where I come from in Louisiana, not long ago, the papers were full of a story where we all know 40 miles of wetland disappear every year. And some of the people hit hardest by that environmental degradation are the local tribes for whom the wetlands are a, quite simply, way of life. The families there can't find shellfish, can't find the fishing that make up their economy. The loss of land, the physical loss of land on which to live is more uh, severe uh, than that. And of course, the flooding and damage that comes from hurricanes uh, is widely known as well. And when the young people of a tribe move away, when that becomes lost, when there is literally no place to live, then we're talking about uh, loss of something that is indescribable. So we're here today to talk, to talk about the next generation of partnership. I'm glad to say that we've made some progress. 
Um, uh, I know that the challenges before us can dwarf the ones that have been behind us in 24 years. I want to give one closing example. Two weeks ago, the San Carlos Apache tribe began construction on a Recovery Act project. Uh, it's for drinking water. It uses green energy, it uses water efficiency technologies, it creates green jobs, and it provides safe drinking water to over 1,000 homes. That's President Obama's clean energy plan in a nutshell. Clean energy, clean environment, and jobs for our people. And that can be multiplied by the approximately $90 million that the Recovery Act set aside specifically for work in Indian country. We want to make sure that we're partners. We want to make sure we address the environmental threats in front of us. As someone just said to me, we want to make sure that it's your voice at the table, not mine's making the final decision on issues that are sometimes hard to judge. Um, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. I will close by asking my staff to stand. I don't know where they are. But recently, we moved our uh, American Environmental Indian Office to the Office of International Activities. Michelle DePass heads that office, and Pete Silva is also here from the Office of Water, which for many years was host to our American Indian Environmental Office. So thank you all. I look forward to your question. Well, I, I'm a little biased, but uh, I do think that President Obama has put together the very best cabinet in the history of the United States of America. Okay? <laughs> We now enter into the dialogue phase. And uh, obviously, there are a lot of questions. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is so more people can ask questions. If you can limit your comment or your statement down to uh, about a minute, and then I will we'll also will try to keep our responses short. Additionally, there are cards, I think, that have been handed out throughout the audience. And so this particular panel is on economic development, natural resources, energy, and agriculture. We want to capture all your ideas, because then what we're going to do is we're going to take the results of this conference, and we're going to compile them into a report, into an action plan as we move forward. So make sure that before the end of the day, you've written out your note so that we've taken advantage of every one of your brains here today. So all the way to the back, uh, all the way to the back, right in front of the cameras. I know, huh? Hello. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. Winikisak Nitapak, that means good day, my friend. You uh, recognized Chairwoman Cheryl Maltese earlier. We are the people of the first light. I'm the other chairperson for the Mashpee Wampanoag on the mainland. And, uh, you know, I heard the Secretary of EPA talk about uh, water and issues around that. And, you know, we're, we're an ocean based tribe, we're a shellfish based tribe. Uh, you know, the jewelry that I have in my hand is wampum. That comes from the quahog shell. And uh, it's, a, it's very impactful to us around clean water problems. You know, we have high nitrogen levels in the bay. Uh, when we try to fish our quahogs and our shellfish for sustenance and economic development, we're harassed on a regular basis by local EPA, by our town agencies, state agencies. And we constantly go to court and we win, but it's painful. Our tribal members get harassed, beat up. And we constantly have to reinforce our laws on the local municipalities and states around, number one, our shellfish beds, which are, are important to the ecosystem because we know it cleans up nitrogen levels, but also being able to keep these waters clean so that we can provide economic development for our people through fisheries and shell fisheries that are known to our culture and who we are as a people. So. We, we need help enforcing these laws with local states and municipalities across the state of Massachusetts and other shell fishing and fishery states where tribes are located to ensure that, number one, our aboriginal rights are supported and upheld. And number two, that we get funding for clean water action to ensure that these waters are clean and that the federal agencies do consult with the tribes, like the MMS, if you will. Cape Winds is another big issue. Our tribe, uh, both the Aquinnah Wampanoag and the Mashpee Wampanoag, you've seen us all over national news taking a beating over that. And these were historical lands. Our, our history goes back 12,000 years on the, those lands when the water was above. As people of the first light, when the sun rises, we have ceremonies. And the, these uh, windmills will impact our, our religious rights as well as our sovereign rights from a historical religious perspective. 
And, you know, the media says, we just jumped on this bandwagon. And we've been involved from the beginning when, when they talked about doing this work. And the MMS has consulted with us. But, again, our sovereign rights need to be respected. We need your help to ensure that they understand these sovereign rights and that we have a say in the word in how we clean up the ecosystem and, and able to do fisheries and shell fishing for economic development while not being harassed or impacted by local, municipal, and state law. Thank you. Lisa, you want to... Do you want to answer quickly on yeah, I think the only thing I could add would be to amplify and agree with uh, your last statement, which I think encompasses all. It, the, the foundation of EPA's Indian policy, and we have words on paper and we are trying to live up to it. Uh, I think we've made some good progress, but we have a long way to go, is to not only uh, recognize, recognizing the, the sovereignty uh, of tribal nations is very important. Um, and the rights given by law that go along with that. And each of our, many, almost all of our environmental laws recognize specific rights for tribal nations. But to build the capacity so that that recognition allows you to have meaningful and informed participation in decisions. And so I, I will simply agree with that and say you outline a range of issues. Again, oftentimes in the environmental world there are uh, pluses and minuses back and forth. What EPA can and must do, in my mind, is deal with the justice of making sure that the voices at the table represent the communities, and in this case, the nations that are affected. Secretary Vilsack has a comment. Yeah, I just want to just add uh, that through the USDA, there are programs available for individual farmers through the NRCS to assist them in preventing runoff that could potentially create problems in waterways, and secondly, uh, a substantial amount of resource available to rural communities for wastewater and water treatment. Again, opportunities to maybe uh, prevent the problem from occurring uh, rather than having to deal with it after it's occurred. Okay. All right, we're going to do boy, girl, boy, girl, so now it's girl. Uh, uh, over here. Yes, over here on the left. Hotnanson. My name's Francis Charles. I'm the tribal chair for Loro Akam tribe. And it's an honor to be standing here in front of the formal governor of Washington state who has tremendously helped Indian country in regards to our cultural and our spiritual lands on Chuichin village site that was desecrated by a mass destruction of the mills in Port Angeles area, Port Angeles, Washington. And we were fortunate enough to be able to rebarrel, rebury over 300 of our ancestral remains. The issues are that we're concerned with our Niagara in pertaining to some of the laws to change so that it protects not only our ancestral remains, but the other nations. I think this went dead as well as the non-natives um, for the protections of some of the pioneer lands that we have out there. Because we are not bordered uh, based with our tribes. It was the non-natives who had put the lands and the territories into divisions because we are all of one and we have been united. But we ask that the commissions and the, the um, secretaries of the state here to address the importance of our cultural resources and the protections of the graves that we have out there that are a national concerns that we have with our environment. So again, uh, I'd like to thank you, Governor. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Governor Locke? Well, let me just, Secretary uh, Locke. Let me just try to amplify that uh, there, are, uh, there are a host of federal uh, agencies and one dealing with archeological and historical preservation, and, and under that uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, there is to be specific consultation with the, with the tribes dealing with the culturally, culturally sensitive lands, especially as we embark on economic development projects uh, on those lands. And as the president indicates, uh, he really wants a very meaningful dialogue uh, and a conversation uh, and consultation with all the sovereign nations, and you all represent those sovereign nations. And so I think that you'll see much more collaboration, much more consultation, and greater sensitivity to the issues that, uh, that, the, uh, that Indian land has with respect to the federal agencies. And um, we certainly, with respect to the Department of Commerce, have that uh, sensitivity as well as we focus on job creation. When we uh, focus on industrial development, when we focus on, on uh, trying to create more uh, 
uh, job opportunities. We need to make sure that uh, as we build uh, uh, cell towers, et cetera, et cetera, as we uh, deploy, uh, create uh, 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 towers for broadband, high-speed internet, that, uh, that these uh, towers and, and other uh, telecommunications installations uh, do not affect culturally sensitive lands. So thank you. And Francis, I'll only add that uh, Assistant Secretary Larry Echohawk and Attorney General Holder and uh, Deputy Assistant uh, Tony Ogden and I were involved in a major law enforcement action in the Southwest where we went after grave robbers and looters and uh, we are not done. Uh, and the strong message that we wanted to send is that uh, the federal laws that protect these very special priceless treasures uh, are ones that we will enforce. Me, uh, back in the back with the vest, right in the middle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, um, for this opportunity. Uh, two items, one uh, under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, those tribes in Oklahoma whose original reservation jurisdictions were subjected to allotment uh, the National Park Service has refused to allow the uh, tribal, uh, the TIPO, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, to have jurisdiction over individual trust properties, although the tribe has jurisdiction over that property and all other matters. The only lands that the Park Service will recognize that are not subject to the state uh, Historical Preservation Officer, SHPO, is those lands that are held in common by the tribe. And the original allotment of lands were part of our reservation area, and we should, the TIPO should have the jurisdiction over those if you could help us with that. The other is that in the interaction between tribes and state entities, cities and counties and towns, in order for us to have a limited liability in, say, a joint venture sewer project or water project or in any way, the only uh, corporate entities that are not, not allowed by the Internal Revenue Service to have a subchapter S election where we could create a tribal corporation that could take a sub S election, invest a certain amount of money in it that would limit our liability, and then use that to joint venture with the city or county or the state. Right now, if a city or county uh, joint ventures with a tribe on, say, a sewer line and there is an accident, the tribe can be sued in Oklahoma court all the way to through the tribal treasury. The state entity can claim exemption. 501c3 tax exempt corporations are allowed to take a sub S election. C corporations, General Motors are allowed to take a sub S election. Almost all corporate entities and the IRS is using the excuse that it's not one stockholder in the, in the sub S corporation, it's whatever the membership of your tribe is. So we have 27,000 members. We're the sole owner of the stock in the sub S corporation as our tribal corporation, uh, federal corporation. But the IRS is saying that there are 27,000 members. And it's unfair treatment because if we had sub S capability, uh, there are many things we could do uh, on and off reservation and those places where there are overlapping reservation and, and state jurisdictions, it would give us uh, a, a, an equal footing and the ability to limit our liability. Thank you. Let me, uh, on the National Park Service issue, uh, let me take that up and uh, we will get back to you uh, and uh, see what it is that we can do there and hopefully we can uh, have the kind of consultation there that, uh, that you seek. On the uh, IRS uh, Treasury liability issue, unless uh, one of my colleagues here have an answer to that, we will make sure that we get uh, Timothy Geithner and we'll get uh, some uh, feedback to you on that. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I apologize. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is John Barrett. I'm tribal chairman of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, John. Okay, it's a woman's turn. So let's go uh, to the very back over there. Uh, right in front of the cameras, stand, yeah, stand up. You got it right there. Right in Hello, thank you. Tina, can you hear me? Okay. Tina Osceola with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And um, this, this question is geared towards um, Secretary Locke and, um, and has to do with tourism. 
and specifically uh, the development of tourism in Indian country and the Department of Commerce's commitment. We'd really like to engage in, in a larger dialogue and expand the scope of tourism within commerce and further define that. Thank you. Secretary Lack. Tourism is actually uh, one of the, uh, uh, the growing parts of our national economy, which we, uh, uh, we actually count it as international trade. Uh, there's tourism within the United States, but we also have a great number of tourists from around the world coming to the United States. And uh, actually, we have more people coming into the United States than Americans uh, going outside the United States uh, for travel. So we actually count that as a positive um, uh, a trade balance, where we have more uh, people from outside the United States coming in and bringing uh, outside money into uh, our U.S. economy. The Congress just passed a... Uh, a Tourism Promotion Act, which will put an assessment of, I think, $10 uh, for uh, foreign visitors coming into the United States. And that $10 will be going into a, a uh, nonprofit uh, uh, public private partnership to really promote tourism of the United States, within the United States. And that will also benefit, quite frankly, Americans uh, who are uh, in these tough economic times wanting to stay at home. And this is an excellent opportunity to really focus, uh, showcase the cultural attractions of uh, Indian land. And uh, so uh, um, we have a, 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 an agency within the Department of Commerce, and so we're very excited about this additional funding that will be uh, made available and that uh, and we want to work with you. And uh, I urge you to also work with your state agencies, uh, you know, when they talk about visit Florida uh, and, and you have state funds to visit Florida or even to visit uh, Las Vegas or Disneyland uh, in Florida or in California, that those state programs also include native lands. Uh, and uh, there's a great interest uh, of people uh, from around the world interested in the art, the culture, the history of, uh, in, of Indian country. So, uh, but uh, with the new dollars that we're gonna be looking at and uh, working with the, the new uh, non-government agency, we clearly want to promote all the great attractions that we have, and that has to include uh, Indian lands. Thank you. Secretary Vilsack. Yeah, if I might add, just uh, in order for uh, there to be uh, opportunities here, that there may be a need for the development of facilities, uh, community facilities that make tourism more attractive or more beneficial, just would remind everyone that the USDA has a community facility grant and loan program uh, we, uh, through the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we've already invested about $15 million in community facilities uh, in uh, Native American areas. Uh, would, would certainly encourage you to take a look at that program as a way of bolstering uh, what you might be able to attract people to. Um, all the way to the back, been standing for a while with a blue shirt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, secretaries. Uh, uh, of President Obama. My name is Matthew Nicolai. I'm president of Jalista Corporation, uh, one of the 12 ANSA corporations. Uh, we appreciated the time that uh, four secretaries came to our region to address our rural issues on fishing, on, on hunting and subsistence and, and energy and, and all the issues that surround Alaska issues. You know, when I listen to all of the problems that we have in Native America, in economic development, in commerce, in, in energy, our issues are always secondary when it comes to attention from the federal government. For over 200 years, you're the first administration secretaries that we've had the time to visit and talk with you directly as Native peoples. I'd like to ask as a native leader that a commission be created to understand and study the effects of economic development and Native America as a total in all administrations. For this reason, I love to see, just like 20 years ago, I never thought we'd have an African president. I love to see in my lifetime maybe a Secretary of Indian Affairs that we'd be able to address all our issues as a unified body. We'd love to see that as Native people. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And suggestions like the ones that you are making will be suggestions we'll take back and in consultation with all of you, try to develop a game plan on how uh, we move forward. All right, let me swing over here to the right. Is there a woman over here on the right? Right there, yes, hand up. Hi. Good, good morning. My name is Doreen Lampy. I'm the president of Nipet Community of the Arctic Slope. In I have, um, And I just want to start from um, the first resolution, which I introduced to you when you came to Alaska for the public hearing. It's ICAST Resolution 2009-09, requesting a resolution supporting a moratorium on oil and gas leasing exploration development activities in the Arctic Continental Shelf of Alaska's Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. And we just recently heard of the really big oil spill in Australia and we're very concerned about the lack of um, industry to shut down that um, disaster. And we just recently passed resolution 2009-14, and I urge all the Native American tribes, indigenous sovereign tribes of um, the United States and all the other countries to pass a similar resolution because they do not have the privilege of voicing their concerns in Australia like we do here in the United States. And I thank you for this invitation and opportunity to speak. This resolution, 2009-14, is a resolution supporting the indigenous nations of the world to declare an international disaster in the oil spill that occurred off the coast of Australia in the Pacific Ocean. As you know, our, our Animals in the Arctic Ocean migrate to the Pacific Ocean, and we are concerned about the industry's um, lack of ability to shut down that oil spill and the lack of um, government enforcement to oversee these activities. Um, we're scared that this could happen in our waters, and we'd like to see more governments be proactive in protecting the oceans and also um, assist the indigenous natives in Australia in this terrible disaster that has occurred. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. <laughs> Since that is a, an interior question, and I do remember meeting you when I was in Alaska, we are. Um, in the process of uh, moving forward with a plan for the Outer Continental Shelf. And uh, while I can't guarantee you what the outcome will be, uh, what I can guarantee you is that uh, we will take into account uh, the best of science and also the input that we are getting from uh, tribal nations uh, who have uh, spoken up and uh, whose uh, concerns uh, I am very aware of. All right, up in the front here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Again, uh, Vice President Ben Shelley. I'm going to be talking to all of the panel up there, panelists up there. Uh, it's concerning Desert Rock Navajo Nation project point, uh, projects. And uh, the Navajo Nation, the Navajo people stand on the edge of a great opportunity, sir, for the United States and the rest of the world by developing our energy and human resource. When we talk about energy, it's talking about revenue. And this is a great opportunity for the Navajo Nation to bring in revenue for its government operation. And uh, human resource, uh, naming the employment that's going to create. And I have always said this, when you throw a water in a puddle, puddle you, you, hear, you see a ripple effect of that. When that ripple effect does happen, it spells uh, economic. It builds home, shopping malls, and so on, schools, and so on. So uh, with this power plant, it, it will work. And again, I'd like again to maybe talk to the, to, uh, the environmental people. We're talking about partnership a lot, and I, I really wanted to read this to you. It's environmental, talk, it, for envir environmental prospect, the Navajo Nation Desert Rock Project will be the cleanest. And as you know, a lot of places in the United States, you have power plants all over. And if you look at all of those and measure the percentage of pollution that they picks up, uh, let me just say this, 90% less is what the Desert Rock Power Plant is going to provide, SO2 PM, and no NOx uh, emission compared to the existing plant. Uh, generate, generating 90% less mercury emission 
existing plant less. This is this power plant well. The other one will be generating 90% less sulfur acid, uh, less than other plant. And the other one is 20% less CO2 than other existing plant. And 85% less water compared to the existing is a plant out there. So what we have here before us, uh, we have the Navajo Nation DPA and uh, Site Global Power LLC, the project's proponents, have committed to pursue the feasibility CCES components for Desert Rock and are awaiting decision on at this point at your at USDOE. And uh, again, let me I'm almost done here. Uh, if you're talking about business model, um, here it is. Developing agreement lease right away, tax agreement, and water agreement all use Navajo laws to resolve dispute, enforceable in Navajo court, respecting tribal sovereignty. We've been talking about that. And then the other one is contract provides for tribal, pref a tribal preference for employment and contracting. And the other one is con contract provided for job training and workforce development. And this is what's going on. Thank you, Vice Partnership. President. One more. Partnership. <laughs> partnership you, you with US, US EPA. <laughs> All right, I'm done here. Uh, partnership with US P EPA. The air permit for Desert Rock has been uh, remits to US EPA. The Navajo Nation and EPA are working together to resolve the remaining issue. We need your assurance that the US EPA and all branches of the federal government will work together to resolve the remaining per permitting, permitting, issue, permitting issue in a timely manner, consistent with the trust obligation of the federal government to the Navajo Nation. And I think we need to do this, as Mr. Secretary, we need your help. Let me finish off with this conclusion. I have been to <laughs> Tulsa. I've been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been to, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, talking about energy, and I made this presentation up there. There's some fine point that came out of there. Why can't we become partners? Why can't you use Desert Rock as a pilot project for the rest of the existing power plant? Does, does it rock? That does needs to rock. happen. So we need Mr. to do Vice that. Mr. Vice Chairman, if I may, I'm going to have uh, uh, both uh, Lisa Jackson as well as Stephen Chu respond to the question. First, uh, let me just say that let me just say that uh, Department of Energy is very committed towards developing energy resources, which include coal resources, but uh, with carbon capture sequestration. Um, specifically, there may be, you know, there's proposals out there, and so I can't really comment on specific proposals that are now under review. But um, as I said before, uh, Indian lands have tremendous amount of energy resources, sun, wind, and fossil resources that we remain committed. The fossil resources we have to uh, develop in a clean way that would be good for the environment, um, and all the other resources. So, so um, in terms of we're very committed in terms of uh, working with uh, the tribal nations in, in trying to develop these resources because this is real wealth creation um, in your lands, and uh, which is also going to be good for the United States. Uh, so we, we, will, we will do that. And uh, many of the other things, the Sox and Ox and Mercury, I think it's uh, Lisa's uh, territory. questions. I've spoken to President Shirley. I know we'll be speaking in the future. You uh, did a good thing, sir, which is bring to the Department of Energy's attention the opportunity to innovate with carbon capture and sequestration at this facility. The issues are tough because it is a very, very large coal-fired plant and there are uh, traditional pollutants as well as greenhouse gas issues as well. Uh, but I think what you did today uh, is, is emblematic of what I saluted you for the last time we spoke, which is trying to find a, a solution that is a winner. Uh, and the clean coal technology is one of the things President Obama is working on. So we will continue to stay at the table. We will continue to uh, work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Uh, middle in the uh, well, well, girl turn over here. Right here. Right here. In the red. The red coats are back. <laughs> no. it's, a, it's an inside Northwest joke. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. Uh, my name is Fawn Sharp. I'm president of the Quinault Indian Nation in uh, the state of Washington. On behalf of the Quinault Nation and the rest of the Northwest Tribes, uh, Secretary, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, really thank you for your vision and leadership with regard to the issue of climate change. Uh, we had the opportunity to participate on, in Monday's session with you, uh, along with 200 other national leaders across the country, and I'm just very encouraged that you invited Indian country to that session. I also want to thank you for the secretarial order on implementing uh, the climate change principles set forth by President Obama that you're also including a provision to have meaningful participation by tribes. I just briefly uh, spoke with uh, Larry Echohawk and, and he's going to work on that right away to partner with tribes to figure out how that'll work on implementation on the ground. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, three years ago when we saw at Quinault that climate change is going to have tremendous value uh, throughout Indian country on Indian lands, we weren't sure whether or not the federal government would respect our right to regulate internally matters of climate change or whether it would be another uh, Black Hills gold situation where valuable resources are discovered, Indian tribes are set aside, and our resources are exploited for the gain of other people. And I just want to thank you that that's a dramatic departure from our history, and it's really encouraging, and I just really thank you for your vision and leadership on that issue. I, one other quick point, and I'll make this 30 seconds. Uh, I want to thank you for um, the opportunity as well to engage us in the budgetary process. Federal agencies have a trust obligation to fund Indian tribes at levels that um, are consistent with our tr uh, managing our trust resources. The Quinault Nation undertook two different studies, one in 2007 and 2008, that dramatically showed uh, a decline uh, baseline funding and how that impacts us. We had a, a BI shortage of foresters and while it may seem like a, a simply a personnel matter, that translated to our uh, annual allowable cut being two and a half uh, years behind. That meant $12 million to our national budget. Uh, we also looked at our uh, managing our fisheries resource and enforcement. We've been the same funding 20 years, and our fishery resource has tripled in that 20 years. We've lost 30% of our spending power, and it's, it's really impacted us at home. So I just really encourage you to continue your vision and foresight to honor uh, our commitment on a government-to-government -government level as well as uh, the trust obligation the United States has to adequately fund our most sacred resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and let me just say, uh, let me just say this team up here is part of uh, the team that is frankly moving forward on the climate change and energy agenda, agenda on behalf of President Obama and we'll continue our work here. Now in order for some space diversity here, I want to go the furthest person on the back on the left and the furthest person on the back on the right. Furthest back. Who, who's at the furthest back because I know how this works in church. The people in the back. Let's see. Furthest back. Stand up if you're the furthest back that wants to talk. Right. Um, Right Thank you. So anybody behind the cameras doesn't want to talk. Okay, you're, you're right there. Go ahead. Stand up. Right there with the, uh, at the very back. Right there. Yes, sir. Okay. White shirt. Um, yep. You're on. I have to go over here. Oh, now you can hear me. My name is George Edwardson, Mr. Secretary. Hi, George. How are you? Very good. I'm the vice president of Inupiat Community from the northern part of Alaska. And you and I have a very, very serious problem. And we got to talk that, about it then. And that problem <laughs> is everybody sitting in here eats salmon. And this nursery that we have discovered and you have in your federal records under the Beaufort Sea Synthesis, a federal report, shows starting from the shores of Alaska to 200 miles offshore over in the Siberian side, over almost 200 mi miles to the west of Wrangell Island and going right past Barrow, almost 100 miles now is a nursery of the salmon stock of North America. This is no guesswork, this is proven. When a hunter from the north travels and we run into the school of fish, the salmon that are less than 12 inches my uncle showed us how th solid that school of fish was. It was eight miles wide, 18 miles long, one school, under 12 inches. He stepped out of his boat, 
nine miles in the ocean and started walking and never went below his knee. That salmon stock is right in the middle of the Chukchi Lee Sale 193. So everybody that eats salmon have to stand up. We need to protect that, Mr. Secretary. That's why you and I have a very serious problem. To me, I don't eat, we don't eat the salmon because it's too small. But what we eat are the seals, the polar bears, and the belugas that eat that salmon. That's our food. But once that salmon matures, it goes down in the Brist Bristol Bay region, and the humans go in a feeding frenzy to catch all the fish they can. Its nursery is in the Arctic Ocean between the United States and Siberia, and we do really need your help because this is a food stock of North America, the northern 20% of North America's fish. That is where it matures. This is no guesswork. You have the records. And George. Once, uh, you, that's what I wanted to say. I, I appreciate the comment. Thank and uh, let me just say, because I know there are lots of uh, questions here on, uh, on the outer continental shelf, and we are taking a, a, uh, a new look uh, because, uh, frankly, the prior administration uh, did not do what uh, we would have done in this administration. So uh, there will be more uh, that we will, frankly, be talking about on the OCS before too long. The very back, waving your hands. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Margot Gray Proctor. I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. But I represent Indian it's business. Mar Margo? Margo Gray Proctor. I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. But when we talk about economic development in Indian country, these are a few of our issues that we have. The land and the trust issue. In order for these tribes to do economic development, I think it was mentioned right of way issues. Also, reformation of our 8A program. The other thing is international trade where we open up the trade and teach the tribes how to do international trade to bring economic revenue into their Indian communities. Entrepreneurism. This is what we've been doing for hundreds, if not thousands of years, is trading amongst one another. But our procurement barriers have always, in government contracting, is a great big issue for us as Indian business people, as tribal enterprises. So I just wanted to say that, and I thank you for the teamwork that you brought today, um, the fellowship. Uh, it's just overwhelming, and thank you. Thank you, Margo. Uh, Secretary uh, Vilsack and Locke uh, on these issues. Uh, one opportunity that uh, we need to take a better uh, advantage of, and I realize that there have been some issues and difficulties with the application process, but in order to expand trading opportunities and economic opportunities, you have to be able to access modern technology. Uh, and one of the President's main objectives with the Recovery and Reinvestment Act was to help to build a 21st century economy. A key component of that will be the access to broadband technology in remote areas. Uh, Secretary Locke and I uh, continue to work hard on trying to improve the process, recognizing that there are some difficulties with what we have done up to this point, but there will be additional resources from the Recovery and Reinvestment Act within USDA. Uh, we're probably looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 billion being available sometime in uh, the year 2010 to expand access to broadband. This is one tool uh, that will allow uh, entrepreneurs, in particular in remote areas, to be able to expand economic opportunities and, ex and expand sales territory. Uh, I, I want to echo what uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack indicated. Uh, we at the Department of Commerce also have about $5 billion that we'll be distributing over the next year and a half for broadband, i.e. high-speed internet. And that will enable the tribes and, and uh, all the entrepreneurs and, and businesses that are tribally connected to really use this technology to help sell your stuff all around the world and you need to take advantage of it, and you can di sell directly to uh, uh, individuals, uh, collectors, businesses um, uh, in, in foreign lands. And, and, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we at the Department of Commerce have a whole host of programs 
to help uh, uh, Native American businesses to get more contracts. Uh, and uh, we want uh, Native American and tribal uh, uh, owned uh, uh, businesses to be part of the federal contracting process as well as just securing contracts with other private sector companies whether it's loan programs, and I know that uh, there are some issues with the Small Business Administration. They've raised their guaranteed loan programs. They have a whole host of programs that are now focused on, uh, uh, on minority and tribal businesses. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more that we can do. I also want to say that uh, on entrepreneurship, uh, we are really focusing in the Department of Commerce on helping new companies. We've created a new office of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, in the last 25 years, virtually all of the net new jobs in America, all the net new jobs in America have come from startup companies. Uh, and we need to really help uh, provide that expertise and uh, know-how uh, to Native American-owned businesses as well. So, um, uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, international trade, incredible opportunities in international trade, and we want to in include more uh, tribal and Native uh, American businesses and uh, industries in our international trade missions as we go abroad. We want to help showcase the great products and services of Native American owned businesses. And we did that when I was governor of the state of Washington. We actually include tribes and representatives of the tribes and businesses of the tribes uh, in our international trade efforts. Thank you, Gary. Now there was, Margo, behind you, there was one other person that I saw behind you. So we're going all the way to the back. The, yeah, yes, sir, with the green, uh, the, the green sheet of paper. Good morning, Secretary Salazar. My name is Bill Isle. I'm a chairman of the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, and uh, our uh, fee to trust application resides in in uh, Interior right now, um, sort of pending the carcieri fix. And I'm hoping, asking that you proceed on a case by case basis and uh, look at those and uh, move them forward and uh, help us with our economic opportunity. We have no reservation right now. Uh, but we do have uh, lands that are held by HUD, and I wanted to thank uh, Secretary Jackson for the uh, EPA grant we just received for our HUD properties to uh, build a new wastewater treatment plant. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And we are, on, on the issue you raise, uh, Larry Echohawk and a number of people within the department are working very hard at trying to get us uh, forward to moving forward on a, on, on a new policy, so more to come on that very soon. Yes, uh, now we'll come to the middle section. We're doing a little space diversity. Uh, the wo woman in the aisle. Skuyana Coy. Uh, my name is Shirley Laos. I'm the vice chair at Trinidad Rancheria in Northern California. And I'd like to make a few comments on uh, an issue that we're having in California on behalf of a lot of uh, coastal tribes. And that's the California Initiative of the uh, Marine Life Protection Act. And the tribes have been trying to get tribal consultation with the state agencies. And the answer is always no, that that's a federal process. And it's, we're having an uphill battle to have input and some uh, dialogue with the, the whole process on the initiative. And what's been happening so far is tribes are being denied their uh, subsistence and cultural gathering along the coast. What's going to impact us is the um, denial of shellfish gathering, sea, uh, seaweed gathering, any cultural or sacred site or ceremonial use along the coast. And we just need a little bit of help trying to interact and get some consultation with the state agencies because the answer is always no. We don't do government-to-government uh, -government consultation with tribes because they're a state. So we would just appreciate any kind of help or advice how we can have more of a, a meaningful and real input on this MLPA initiative uh, in California. Thank you. Thank you very much. For our part on the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which falls under uh, Secretary Locke's jurisdiction and NOAA, we will, uh, obviously, the President's order will require consultation of all of, all, of, all of our agencies. And uh, hopefully what we will see is uh, that the state governments will also follow the consultation lead that President Obama has set forth this morning. All right. Uh, 
We it's about 12:05, so uh, we're going to have maybe time for about two or three more questions. Um, so who really wants to ask a question? <laughs> God, look at all these hands. All right, well, all right. Well, we, we're going to go right in the middle first here. The, 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 no, the, mat, uh, the Thai white shirt right there in the middle. Now, are, all, are all of you from Washington? See over here, all the Washington folks have already, uh, you know, you, you have Gary Locke over here as a great ambassador, so I want to call in the middle. Go ahead. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. My name is Jim Gray. I'm Principal Chief of the Osage Nation, also known as Margo's little brother. But uh, I also wanted to say that uh, this is something that we're going to have an opportunity, and, and many of us are very anxious to ask questions like this because while it's tempting to be complimentary and constructive, I, I feel like I have an obligation to my own people to be more direct with my question. And, and really, I think many other tribes are feeling very similar the same way. In the past practices, when a tribe has claims that they want to bring against the United States for mismanagement of their trust claims, this process has been uh, pretty effective in being able to uh, uh, beat these tribes down through attrition. The United States has unlimited sums of money to fight these cases for years and generations. Sometimes cases go on for 20, 30 years before they're ever resolved. In these times when the t budgets are tight, the monies that uh, the tribes have to take care of their citizens is being diverted to fight these claims in the courts. And I heard President Obama during the campaign say that in his administration, he was committing himself to resolving these tribal trust claims during his administration. And while I've been very uh, reluctant to, to not say anything too harsh, I would like to know if Secretary Salazar, you could speak to that issue as his appointee. Jim, I would be delighted to speak to that issue, and I can just tell you that I have personally spent uh, a good deal of my own time uh, with uh, the Solicitor General of the United States, Hillary Tompkins, and uh, with others uh, who are in the Department of Justice uh, working to see how we might uh, get to a resolution. And uh, um, I'm, hope I'm hopeful, and uh, stay tuned. More to come. Okay. Uh, right here. And let me, not, not to be so short on that question, uh, Jim, but the, 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 his, the history of it is true, that there has been a uh, mismanagement of claims and uh, trust assets, and uh, that's why there has been this litigation that has been going on for 13 years. Uh, it's been a blemish, frankly, on the whole relationship uh, between the United States and, uh, and, uh, and Indian communities, uh, tribes and individual Indians. And so uh, we are committed uh, to changing that. And uh, we, uh, there's things that I can say today and things I can't say, but I can tell you that we're working on it very hard and there's a lot more to come very soon. Hello, my name is Joanne Polston. I'm first chief of the Mendeshag tribe of Healy Lake, Alaska. And I would like to ask your support in the development of transportation and intermodal transportation infrastructure development in Alaska uh, this is key to us uh, in our unique needs in meeting um, the things that most people in this country take for granted in order to access um, medical care, uh, safety, EMS, all of, all of the things that, that uh, most people take for granted. Our unique situation makes quite difficult. Uh, this also allows us to um, access economic development, ec opportunities and other things that would promote uh, sovereignty and and uh, self-sufficiency as well. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And I'm going to, Tom, do you want to respond to that just a little bit? And also, uh, you're right. Ray LaHood is uh, very interested in this, issue, in, in this issue. He's not part of this panel, uh, but uh, he serves with us uh, on the cabinet, and uh, certainly it is an issue that we will raise with him. Tom? During uh, our visit to Alaska, uh, we saw firsthand uh, the concerns that you've raised about the capacity and the cost uh, to individuals uh, because of the transportation system in terms of being able to access basic services. Uh, it is not a circumstance where you simply drive down uh, the street and go to the doctor's office. Uh, in many cases, it's an airline ticket that costs eight or nine hundred dollars to be able to get medical care. 
uh, obviously that needs to be addressed. So first and foremost, we will certainly convey your concerns to Secretary LaHood. Secondly, within USDA, there is a business and industry program called the BNI program, which provides uh, long-term loans uh, that might be able to be utilized uh, together with other USDA programs to provide the resources that would allow for expansion uh, of the kinds of, of businesses that would support those transportation systems. And then third, not to return to uh, an issue we've already addressed, but the whole issue of broadband, being able to utilize technology to make up for distance uh, difficulties that you're, you're suffering. If we could establish broadband, then there might be the opportunity for a small clinic uh, in, a, in a village to be able to access uh, world-class medical services through telemedicine, uh, world-class educational opportunities through uh, long-distance learning. Uh, so it is one of the reasons why the President is so insistent on trying to get these resources to remote areas. So we will certainly convey your concerns that they, they are real and they make a real difference to people. Thank you, Joanne. Gary? And I'm looking forward to, uh, on Monday having a, a conference call with uh, many of the tribal leaders here today, uh, specifically on uh, the grant opportunities uh, of the uh, broadband high-speed internet uh, program available through the Department of Commerce serving uh, unserved and underserved areas. Okay. What I'm going to do is ask my uh, colleagues on the cabinet to close with uh, one minute statement each, and we'll start with Lisa and we'll move forward this way uh, so that we can keep the conference on track. Uh, so uh, uh, Lisa Jackson, if you will. Uh, Go first. Uh, uh, well, I'll just uh, end where I began, which is to say uh, I thank you for uh, your time today. Uh, the two assistant administrators I introduced earlier are going to stick around a little bit to take specific cards and questions. We uh, can't answer them all right today, but more than likely uh, that the more efficient way would be to promise to get back to you or to your staff on specific issues. Uh, I want to say that uh, I remain as committed as ever to uh, a government-to-government -government relationship with all the twists and turns and good and bad of that. And somebody let uh, Chairman Barry know that I did get the message that he asked about the Tar Creek Superfund site, and I'm going to take a personal look at that myself. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Secretary Chu. So I, <clears throat> again, uh, just wanted to reiterate uh, my deep conviction that my deep conviction that uh, uh, there's incredible opportunity uh, for the tribes to, to really take part in what needs to be a new industrial revolution, the creation of energy, the uh, creation of energy for your own use. Uh, when I visited um, Native Alaskans, I was uh, both touched and worried and shocked about, about the condition that the one doesn't see a connection to a grid, so how do you actually take this energy, store it, and use it in, in an important way? Let me also say that um, you're looking at members of the Green Cabinet, and the, the kind of waking up of the United States towards the concerns of the climate are something that I know you knew and your ancestors knew long before Americans knew this. Uh, that the, the trust of the environment, the nurturing of the environment is something, I'll tell you quite frankly, this is why I'm here. I, I got very worried about climate change. The people in, the, in Alaska, the people in, in the Pacific Northwest that I met know this because they see it with their own eyes. It's much more apparent there than it is uh, within the Beltway here. And, um, and so you can rest assured that the people you see before you, this cabinet, this, this part of the cabinet, feels that uh, the ultimate conservation on all grounds, to conserve the fisheries, to conserve the land, the water, this is a sacred trust that we all have. And uh, we are very committed to making sure that uh, the United States moves in a direction that you have historically been there for centuries. Thank you, Secretary Chu. Secretary Vilsack. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Salazar. And again, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon. It's, a, it's an honor and privilege to be among the tribal leaders today. Let me just briefly, in the minute I've been given, speak of two issues very quickly. One is uh, the, the uh, commitment that every single person in this room has to the young people uh, of this country. 
And within USDA, we recognize we have a, a unique responsibility uh, as it relates to the tribal uh, colleges and universities. Uh, the research and uh, education and economics portion of our mission area is conducting a review of the 1994 institutions uh, to ensure that the uh, 18,000 students uh, that currently go to those uh, universities and colleges are getting a fair opportunity to uh, pursue their dreams uh, and their hopes and aspirations. We take that responsibility very seriously. Secondly, uh, this department has had a very spotty record as it relates to civil rights. Um, while it was formulated as the People's Department by Abraham Lincoln in 1862, it has failed to live up to that standard. Uh, President Obama has been quite clear uh, to me and to, I suspect, all the cabinet members uh, that he wants his uh, administration to be reflective uh, of a civil rights legacy that we can be proud of. And I realize that we too have litigation that's been going on for a considerable period of time involving a number of uh, farmers, uh, and we are committed uh, to trying to get that matter resolved as expeditiously and as fairly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. Secretary Locke. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Salazar, for moderating this and hosting this in your beautiful, beautiful building. And uh, to all of you, uh, I, I take uh, very, very seriously uh, the government-to-government -government relationship uh, between the United States and all of the tribes. I'm really proud and very pleased that uh, uh, with over some 500 federally recognized tribes that uh, we have almost 90 percent of the tribes in America here today represented. This is a new administration, and uh, President Obama is absolutely committed to a new day, a new relationship with the tribes uh, of America. Uh, the, the President is very focused on job recovery, trying to bring prosperity back to America, and he's inherited a very, very tough situation. Uh, thanks to his policies and the support of the uh, various members of Congress, uh, we have avoided a great uh, second depression. Uh, but too many people are without jobs. And the prosperity that the President wants will not be complete until uh, that prosperity also includes Indian country. So we at the Department of Commerce stand ready to work with you in this new relationship, focusing on prosperity for all the peoples, all the peoples of America. And uh, so I look forward to, to continuing the conversation and approaching this relationship with the same respect and recognition of your sovereignty as I did when I was governor. And I look forward to our conversation on Monday with many of you on the issue of uh, a broadband high-speed internet access uh, and the programs that we at the Department of Commerce in, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture have. So uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you.